Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast, the industry's first and longest running podcast now in our 17th year. I'm Roger Gross, the publisher of GGB, and this week we sit down with Anthony Gowan, the CEO of G3, a company dedicated to finding solutions to responsible wagering on esports. This week's podcast is sponsored by IGT. Visit IGT at G2E to experience the latest in customer-centric hardware, next-generation game themes, turnkey system solutions, award-winning cashless technologies, and the hottest iGaming and sports betting solutions. Welcome to the Global Gaming Business Podcast. My guest today is Anthony Gowd, the head of G3 uh, Gaming. Uh, Anthony, n- nice to uh, meet you uh, virtually here. Uh, we've talked over the last couple of weeks, and uh, I'm interested to get to what, uh, what what your opinions are on some of the things that are going on in esports. Thanks, Roger. I'm interested in talking about those exact things. Great. We've had a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, attempts to make esports and casinos work together. Some mm-hmm. have worked a little bit. Some haven't worked at all. Uh, there's been a few instances of esports betting. So, so uh, you know, is is there any real realistic partnership possible between esports and casinos at this point? Yeah, I think actually that's where it's going. So, if we look at what has worked and what hasn't worked, uh, and really the idea behind it, if we can take a step back. Um, I think we'll better understand the problem, right? So sure. if we take a step back and look at what are the what are the, the demographics saying today about the 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 video game and esports business? Where it's saying that it's a $200 billion market, right. it's endemic, 70% of the United States population. Uh, and I'll just keep my, my comments to that. Uh, are um uh, play video games on a regular basis, on a daily basis, whether it's mobile games or console games. E games, right, and that's a much larger market than the iGaming gaming market. Uh, when you take into account how many people regularly gamble, right? Sure. So one of the misconceptions, in my opinion, of how we've started entering into this space in the iGaming gaming market is that we're looking at sportsbook as the indicator for what's going to be the big driver, and I don't think it is sportsbook. I do think sportsbook is a part of it. Yeah, but I actually think it's more. Well, I think it's eye gaming, right? So you're taking a look at slot machines, poker, blackjack, and replacing those games with an entirely new extension of video games that, that, that this millennial Gen Z demographic is already used to. So we don't want to reinvent anything. We're saying play the same games you're playing now, the same right. games, mm-hmm. and we're going to add uh, uh, wagering and ways to make money in those games. Okay. As an example of that, you have Electronic Arts making $3,000 a minute on uh, FIFA soccer video game uh, loot crates, which are basically randomized card creators. So you can get uh, cards randomly. You pay money, and sometimes you get good cards. Sometimes you get bad cards. Um, but the industry has already adopted this. The video game industry has already adopted this to some extent, um, and it has generated so much money that in some areas, in some countries, it has been banned. Yeah. Because it doesn't have the compliances. It, it hasn't come with the compliances that are required for iGaming, right? The controls, um, the age uh, verification, the anti-money laundering. So what my company, G3, um, Gunhammer Gaming Group, is doing is putting, is creating a way to wager in that space with all the expected uh, standardized iWagering uh, requirements and next level biometrics and next level um, sort of um, responsible gaming that is uh, more appropriate for today's day and age. Okay, great. So I, I was to, went to a couple of uh, esports tournaments at casinos. Uh, one went at the Cosmopolitan. I guess that's almost ten years ago now. And, oh. uh, and uh, you know, while while they did fill up the rooms and things like that, most of the most of the attendees were were pretty young. You know, they couldn't even walk into the casino. Uh, um, but but I understand they've aged a little bit since since those days. And uh, uh, is, is that a, a way the casinos can get involved with these sports? A legitimate way? Well, the average gamer is thirty five years old. Right. Okay. Thirty five year old male and a forty five year old female. And and you have to look at it from two to different points of view why aren't these gamers um the 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 gaming demographic why aren't they engaging with casino products right and when they are what kind of casino products are they engaging with 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we've known that, you know, the slots take up 70 to 80% of a casino floor. Right. And that's exactly the kind of product that doesn't engage with this demographic. So the quite you asked me earlier, how will will esports and video games uh you know work with casinos and why hasn't it? I guess that was an implied question. And it the infrastructure hasn't been created yet, and that's what we're doing now. So not just through my company, but also through the esports trade association, the regulated video game and esports committee, and a whole bunch of other companies that we were working in partnership with to create this space. So in that space, when they engage with iGaming products initially, uh, you're going to be able to play, let's say, a video game like Tetris for real money. Yeah. In states that allow you to have randomized elements in it for iGaming, mm-hmm. you're going to be able to have jackpots in that game. So in a sense, it is kind of like a slot machine. Sure. But it's a new version of what a slot machine is. It's not really like the reels rotating, but there right. are randomized elements that just play out in different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, uh, that, that's why we're so confident about it. This is already what they're doing. And the underground wagering market for video games and I and, and the underground and the gray market wagering market is already um, very significant. There are companies that are making several hundred million dollars a year on gray market video game wagering. Sure. Right. So there's a, there's a parallel here, I think, with with skill games. I mean, one of the problems with skill games is if you got good at it, you know, it, you, they would never really let you win. You know, uh, you, you know, maybe they'll give you back 98 percent of your money, but you're never going to really get an edge on it. Whereas and I know in, in, in esports, some, some of these people that that play are just fantastic. And and if they don't get back you know, what they put into it, they're going to get bored after a while, which ha- is what exactly what happened in, in uh, skill games. Uh, uh, Gameco came out with a product that, that was really exploratory. Mm-hmm. So it was a ra- right idea, wrong execution, right? Yeah. And part of what you need to do is really move the product to an online uh, iGaming, right? Because right. creating a new arcade on a casino floor where the floor is very valuable and, and people have to have discoverability, you have to be able to see it and find it. That just creates adds complications. Most people who play gaming uh, video games are actually on mobile phones. So that's where we want to launch the product. That's where anybody should launch the product. Right. So, um, but trying to figure out how to make revenue is, is relatively simple after that. You know, you take a rake or you, you use those skill based gaming uh, already established practices. But where you add the iGaming elements is the randomized element. So it's like poker, right? So there is a skill in poker, as you know, but there's also, you don't know what the cards are going to be. No. So when you get those cards, the equivalent of what those cards are in video game, it could be asteroids, it could be football players, it could be, you know, aliens, it doesn't really matter. Those are the randomized elements, but then the player has to use their skill to try to maximize their ability to, to score points uh, or engage in winning conditions uh, with those randomized randomized elements, and that's where the skill comes in. Okay. If you don't have the randomized element, yeah, there is a there is a situation there where you have whales, which is what the video game industry calls for the big spenders, right? Um, where you have people that are beating up on younger uh, and less experienced players. Mm-hmm. Now we have some technological solutions for that, and biometrics, and and being able to create an Evo type system to kind of uh, artificial artificially use artificial intelligence to dictate what your actual playing level is. So you can't fake it, play lower than you are. And then all of a sudden uh, enter a low stakes tournament and win it all because you're actually a high um, proficiency player. Sure. Um, but we, we feel that all those are solvable, especially in the space that we're in, which is, which is extremely high tech compared to iGaming, right? So you have, um, you know, all the gaming companies, including AWS, that have these technology stacks that are that allow you to read um, into the analytics of the player pretty pretty deeply to mm-hmm. be able to get not just what their real playing level is, and not just the biometric uh, 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 verification of who they are, but allows you to also learn about the player to create products that more are tailored to individuals or groups of people. Uh, where if you like this thing, you might also like this thing more. Um, we can. So there's a lot of learning here. It's an entirely new space, Roger. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's talk about how regulators approach this space. Obviously, no matter whether you're going to be in a real casino or in an iGaming uh, uh, platform, 
you're going to have to you know approach them and, and make them feel feel like uh you know everything's on the up and up and and what you right. mentioned just there was uh you know how can you tell when somebody's cheating i mean uh you know i always thought that uh you know a little flick of the wrist when you get eaten by a dragon you know was that real or was was that uh was that just you throwing the, the game you know i mean it, it's hard hard for me to wrap my arms around and i can imagine same thing is, is true of the regulators it's just the true of the regulators. We've spoken to about 32 of them so far. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, that's where I go back to the technology. Technology actually can be very sophisticated detecting, uh, you know, fraud detection and tampering. Right. So, so without getting into, into the weeds too much, um, a lot of things players will do is kind of quit a match before the match is over and say it was like some sort of, you know, I lost my internet or something. Right. But we we do look into that ourselves. We know what their internet connection is and whether they lost a connection or not, right? right? So using technology, that's just one example. Using technology, you can start to look into the different ways that players have to to to, to cheat and try to game the system. Right. Um, some uh, publishers, um, such as Riot, use um, a, a product called Vanguard, which kind of does a root level scan of everything on someone's computer to see what's running at that time. Right. So they can see if there's any art AI assisted aim bots, which is uh, technology that allows you to aim at players better, whether there's been modifications to the original game code, which is something we do ourselves, um, whether the line is tampered to increase or decrease latency. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a lot of different technological solutions that we can use uh, which is a substantial help in something that is, is I think, going to be very large. So you have a large number of users, and the technology is really the only way to kind of track that stuff. Sounds like a high-tech version of steroids. <laughs> it's a very high-tech version of monitoring that in ensures safety and right. it makes sure that when somebody wins, that the, the group has a consensus that this person did win uh, because of their ability, not because they cheated somehow. Sure. So are, are you involved in, in any regulatory system right now other than informing the regulators, uh, uh, you know, how this is supposed to work? Uh, very deeply, actually. Um, in New Jersey, especially, you know, mm -hmm. we, we help the assembly draft uh, A637 and are helping on a new um, amendment to A637, which will be introduced this Thursday, okay, um, September 15th. We have been working with states such as uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan. Uh, we're working with lobbyists throughout the country to introduce or uh, the, the concept of video game and esports wagering. Uh, and we, of course, we run that uh, esports trade association regulated committee, right. where we have had roundtables with 32, uh, 32 states uh, that are all. The regulators from those states, actually, actually, 32 states and territories, I should say, because there are some Canadian territories involved in that. Um, okay. So the questions, the kind of questions they ask are, you know, what is the compliance system? How do some of them you already asked? Like, how do we verify cheating? Um, what are the standardized technologies that we're going to use? Uh, what are, you know, what kind of games are there? How do we play these games? Uh, what's the, the, the average time per game play? You know, they want to try to make a, a, a equivocacy with like slot machine, um, money in and out, um, a whole range of feature uh, of discussions that are, uh, brought up with these regulatory groups. Right. Um, so I have confidence as part of this that we will have about, um, 14 states that come on board into the, the video gaming and esports wagering, either allowing or by creating um, new laws to allow it in the next uh, two to three years. And in the next five years, probably all 32 states that are in the committee or have attended the committee will probably be online. Okay, great. So New Jersey seems to have a leg up on on this esports wager. I know uh, very much Reebok very well, and he you know he uh, he's always been ever since he took over. He's always been open to innovative uh, uh, ways to bet and to to get keep the state ahead of it. So uh, how 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 far ahead is New Jersey of some of the other states and jurisdictions? Uh, they are in the lead. I mean, they are far in the lead, right? So uh, David Reebok was really the impetus for us to 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 sort of readdress this area and find out how to do it. 
Right. Um, but New Jersey has a whole infrastructure from the governor's office to the NJEDA to, you know, uh, Atlantic City Chamber of Commerce, which I'm a, a member of, to the, the um, casino groups here that all have been thinking about how to do this for the last four or five years. Right. Right. And, and you know, our efforts um, and people like Don Guardian, who are really yeah. supportive of this. Right. Mm-hmm. So uh, we've put our efforts together to sort of unify these groups to, to, to make sure that everyone's on the same page um, and then speak with not just our company, but other companies to the, the trade association and make sure that we understand what what their needs are. Right. Because where I go back and, and, and talk about um, why the industry hasn't succeeded yet is because the Americans are trying to take an, a model established in Asia. Mm-hmm. I used to own a company in South Korea um, and, and Seoul and take that model, which worked extremely well there, where it's a national pastime. And in Europe as well, and apply it directly to the United States without really understanding how different the United States is from both of those markets. So you you probably already know how different it is in iGaming, but it's also okay. different in just culture generally. Sure. And you can't expect the same practices that worked in those two areas to to be brought over without modification and work here. And that's what that's what has happened. Sure, absolutely. Visit IGT at G2E to experience the latest in customer-centric hardware, next-generation game themes, turnkey system solutions, award-winning cashless technologies, and the hottest iGaming and sports betting solutions. Must-see innovations will include the all-new Peak Dual Gaming Machine, designed for incredible performance, play experiences, and maximum comfort. Stop by the Wheel of Fortune Jackpot Zone for the chance to win a deluxe Holland America Cruise and other prizes. See you in Vegas. Absolutely. So let's talk about how, how casinos could get these these uh, folks on their casino floor. I mean, these are the people they want, the, the millennials, the Gen mm-hmm. Zers, you know, uh, these are the people they want to replace old people like me. So um, what can the casinos do to attract those players using esports to their casinos? Is it, is it going to be something like a esports lounge or, uh, you know, we've seen several of them in action here in Vegas uh, that uh, some worked, some didn't? I think it's much I think it's it's actually bigger than that, right? So esports lounges are very just in theory are just these places people can go to and, and I guess watch esports like esports books. Right. But I think you know everybody has a cell phone, right? So when you walk into a casino floor, the geolocation and and, mm-hmm. and apps can open up a host of games that they can't do off the floor, right? So you can use their phones to to create to, to play right. games, and they oh. don't have to be in a specific lounge. Um, on the floor games can work, but I think the bigger experience is, well, let me paint it for you because this is sort of like a, a, <laughs> a kind of creative thing, right? So imagine, if you will, being in a room and you've been training this horse on your phone uh, for the last couple of months. So this is a uh, an app that allows you to train race horses. It doesn't have to be a horse. It could be a, a race cat. It could be a race unicorn. It could be anything. It's right. a video games, right? So everything goes. But in this game, uh, you feel that you're ready for this thing that this animal of yours, let's just call it a unicorn, to, to race against other people's um, um, animals. So you go into the casino, you go in a room, and in this room there's a, a, a s- monitors that surround you up on the ceiling a little higher than the floor. And all you have to do is take your animal and swap and, and sort of swatch it on, swipe it on, and all of a sudden your unicorn is up there, but so is the other people in the room. There's a cat and there's a... Yeah. You know, and now you've trained your unicorn to be really good at mud and avoid lasers because it is a video <laughs> game. So, but other people may be better at like climbing mountains and avoiding, you know, aliens, right? right. And then you race. And when you race, it's not you racing anymore because your your input is done. Yeah. You train that unicorn. Now okay. it's just like a racehorse. Now it's randomized. Sure. It's the, the, the unicorn has certain abilities, but it's also a randomized course. So you don't know what to expect. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think when you talk about those big group experiences of how do we make gamers come into a casino and do exciting things, that's where the, the field is wide open because yeah. you're definitely, you're talking about taking a little bit of the Walt Disney experience. And I worked for Walt Disney for quite a while as creative director. 
um, taking the Walt Disney experience and bringing it to these casino floors in the form of real money wagering or real money video games. And I think the market for that is going to be huge. Okay. People enjoy spending time uh, and equating that with an amount of money. Uh, what we're saying is not only can you, you know, you're going to spend time and spend money anyway, but you can win it back as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I've been traveling around to a lot of sports books here in New Jersey and, and on the East Coast. And, you know, most of the time they're kind of empty. I mean, imagine if you could have something like that, you know, that would bring esports people into the, the, the vacant sports books at that time, you know, just, just my, and then, and then to create the excitement that a race like that would do. I mean, that, that, uh, that's a good solution, I think. It's, it's an exciting solution because it shows what, what, what has been missing from slot machines, which is, player agency, the ability to, for the player to make a decision that actually impacts their success or, or, or lack of success, right? And that's a slot machine. It's all artificial, right? You hit the button. You don't know. The random number generator takes over. There's a, a rate that's supposed to be returned by law, but you don't know when that rate's returned. Um, but if you create a race car and someone does a Daytona 500 in a casino where, you know, you've trained the, the car as much as you can, or you want to race the car directly, that's an entirely different experience. Right. And it's an experience that I think a lot of people would be blown away by. Mm -hmm. you know? And it makes, it, you don't have to go into some sort of, here's the five steps why people are going to like it. You know they're going to like it. Right. Right. It's entertainment. And I think people forget that wagering and all these things are forms of entertainment that need to actually make the people happy, even if they lose money. Right. You seem to uh, to be uh, leaning, and I've heard other people say this as well. Toward esports is is going to always stay on the devices because that's really where we're going to start it. So the the exercise of making an esports say slot machine is is just not going to work because it's not the natural form. That kind of uh, leads me to the question about authenticity. How how authentic do you have to be for players to to play uh, one of your esports games? Well, and that's the real trick with this generation, with the millennial and, and, and Gen Z generation. The term that's used in the esports industry is called endemic, uh -huh. meaning that if you don't aren't part of this group, they look at you as an outsider. Right. And being endemic is one of the critical deciding factors that people make, whether they're going to try your experience or not. And I think part of what's going on right now is that, and I hate to pick on a company, but I will. Uh, companies mm -hmm. like GameCo create games that sort of look like video games, but when you play them, it's not a video game and it's also not a good eye gaming experience. Right. Right. So it's, it's, it's the worst of both ex uh, worlds. So what we intend to do is to take the existing game world, existing games that are well known and provide ways to make, wagers and compete for real money with games that people already know and love right uh, and i think that's the only way to really do it successfully sure that, that brings me to another complicated problem which is uh which is basically uh only endemic esports which is uh you know all these games have different publishers and right and and so you've got to work through these publishers to be able to to bet on their games or anything like that. I mean, that is that is that uh, kind of a, a new phenomenon in terms of how how uh, you know esports publishers work together, or uh, you know how how's that going to work when when you do have this uh, you know mature betting system that you can bet online, um, you know, and, and you got all these publishers wanting their cut. Well, the good news is that we've tackle that problem head on. So we used to be a publisher ourselves. Okay. So, uh, you know, we, I've been a game developer and of course we've worked with Microsoft uh, in the past and we, we, we were a developer uh, in a publisher at Disney. So we, we know both sides of things. Um, and I can tell you that we've had many conversations with the Entertainment Software Association uh, and publishers. And we've gotten permission from publishers to do proof of concepts here in Atlantic City. Mm -hmm which we're going to announce soon, which is very exciting. We do have a casino partner um, for this proof of concept with a publisher. And what we're trying to prove out is that we can do this safely and in a regulated way. Yeah. That's really the proof because what companies, I think I mentioned earlier that Electronic Arts makes $3,000 a minute right. on, on Loot Crate Mechanics. They 
once they get the go ahead that this is going to work, that they aren't going to be liable for a system that's faulty, where a child starts wagering on a product or someone utilizes a cheat to, to, to wait, make more money than they should, um, they all of them will come in, right? But to the, the listeners and the viewers, the difference that what you're alluding to is that, you know, very similar to wagering football. You can wager on NFL football without using the NFL license, but right. it's really tough because right. you have to say like Philadelphia green versus New York blue. Well, that's the Eagles and the giants, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't for video games, it's much, much tougher because it's harder to identify the games without being specific to, Hey, this is Valorant or this is call of duty or this is halo. And this is, you know, uh, cloud nine or phase clan. It's almost impossible to try to, mention the ip in a in a in a in a roundabout way without directly mentioning it right so uh it is something that requires the approval and partnerships with the publishers mm -hmm. um, but from our conversations they're just waiting to get in on this just in the same way that all the professional sports agents uh companies are waiting to get in before sports books mm -hmm. launched right i mean it's right. really almost the exact same situation as long as it's safe they will come on board Okay, great. So Entain re recently bought uh, Unicorn. Uh, I, I followed Unicorn very closely from the, their launch, and uh, and then suddenly they kind of disappeared into Entain, which of course is a giant uh, uh, gaming company. Um, are you going to need a, a platform for all these all these companies that have online casinos and on online gaming, uh, a separate platform, or, or is, is there going to be some, at some point uh, where uh, 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 technology will put them all together? Well, I think you're always going to have different companies offering different things. Now, Charles Conroy um, was recently on my panel uh, in Chicago, uh, which was the, the topic was esports wagering and video game wagering. And he um, works over at Unicorn now at Entain okay. uh, on the esports uh, side of it. So, you know, Charles has a plan. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually not, it's different than our plan, but I think, you know, Charles and I have decided to sort of lift the space together. Yeah. Uh, because all of us kind of, you know, it's it's better at this point in time that all these companies sort of pick a lane and say, okay, well, we have all the same issues. And if we are in different enough lanes with as little as much overlap, then we can work together collaboratively to to kind of lift the space and establish a space, which is what we're doing. Uh, we've decided to do it together. We haven't started doing it, but we've recently decided to do that. Right. So, so you're going to see different platforms mm -hmm. in the same way that you see Caesars versus DraftKings versus FanDuel. I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of platforms because I can tell you that in the four years that we've been developing ours, um, this is the toughest thing the development team has ever done. Yeah. And this is a seasoned professional console team that comes from one of the big publishers uh -huh. and they, you know, they tell me uh, on a regular basis, actually, that creating the platform itself is relatively easy for them. It's adjusting the platform to all the requirements that are that each state separately requires and right. differently requires. Mm -hmm. That's the real uh, difficulty here. So an example of that, um, which I gave earlier today was, um, for example, if you win over five thousand dollars, that amount has to be reported to um, to agencies that represent delinquent payments uh, for for uh, custody battles or or, oh. or delinquency for payments for uh, uh, um, child payments, right? For yeah, child right. so child support payments and divorce decrees and all these things. All these reporting systems are kind of complicated, but you have to do it. Sure. Right. Yep. Or self-exclusion, which is very difficult to do in the gray market because you don't really know who these people are anyway. Right. Right. So you delete an account. They just create a new one with a new email. And that's impossible to determine without uh, know your customer compliance systems. Right. Exactly. All right, well, one more question. Uh, what would a, a mature uh, sports betting, esports betting uh, system look like? Would you be able? Would you vote on, on? Would you be able to bet on tournaments or head to head and what you're playing, or or would it be even like a spectator exactly like uh, like just sports betting is today? 
I can tell you what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, eventually we're going to get to that unicorn horse face example that I mentioned right. earlier. And that is technological poss technologically possible right now. We just really are focused on getting the platform uh, uh, launched. Um, you're going to see paramutual gameplay like poker, little poker rooms that you, you know, kind of poker like rooms where you can wager against other people in short matches. You're going to see best score, best score of the week, sure. best score in New York City as opposed to Atlantic City, different sort of prize pools, very similar to what you see now. Right. You're going to see um, the ability to play, uh, you know, Twitch is something that a lot of people don't understand if you're not in the video game world, but Twitch is ESPN for video games. Right. And it's, but the difference is it's way larger than ESPN ever was. So at any given moment, there's about three to 6 million people on Twitch now. Right. Um, like right now. So the, the, we are going to be able to have live video mm -hmm. where you can play against a streamer, which is the most popular form of entertainment right now that there is. So somebody is the game host. They are playing, you know, a game similar to Angry Birds. Right. Um, and I'm throwing these game names out as examples, not sure. that we're actually doing that game. Sure. Uh, or we're not doing that game, I, I can't say. But games like Angry Birds, uh, they'll be able to say, okay, we're all going to play. Whoever gets the highest score, everybody right. puts in the dollar, we'll get that amount, yeah. right? And so you're going to be able to see that. You're going to be able to wager on, and you're going to be able to enter in tournaments, whether they're short tournaments for a day or longer tournaments for 30 days. Both of those are available. Some of those tournaments are online tournaments that will lead to physical locations. So like a poker tournament where you qualify online by go to a live tournament. Right. And those are really the ones that we're excited about. Um, and you're going to be able to wager on individuals and on third party pro and collegiate and amateur esports teams where we have a media group um, that we're launching uh, and we're going to announce soon with a major, one of the largest sports media companies in the world. Um, we're going to be able to to be able to get the data from these events to allow you to do third party wagering as well. And it can, and then after that, it, the experience I mentioned inside the casino is where we're going after that. Yeah, so there's a lot of really exciting uh, spaces we're taking it here. But um, you know, I had a, I was at the Code Conference last week in, in in Beverly Hills, and I spoke to Mark Cuban, and his opinion was that esports failed. Yeah, and my opinion is, I understand why he thinks that, sure. but the reality is, esports and video game wagering hasn't even started here. Right. So, an investment three years ago was premature. An investment two years from now is exactly the right time, and I believe you're going to see that this space ends up being bigger than the established iGaming and sportsbook space. Great. Well, Anthony, it sounds like you got a lot on your plate here and a lot of exciting yeah. developments coming up here. Let's stay in touch so so we can find out uh, exactly where esports is going because I kind of agree with you. I think it's it really is just starting and people get, gave up on it too soon here and it's just a matter of it, it becoming more mature and people like you are, you know, bringing your creativity to it and, and bringing it forward. Thanks, Roger. And, and I'm glad you agree. And let me know anytime you want to talk. I will be on. Hope you enjoyed this week's podcast sponsored by IGT. Visit their booth at G2E to experience the latest in customer-centric hardware, next-generation game themes, turnkey system solutions, award-winning cashless technologies, and the latest iGaming sports betting solutions. To learn more about esports in the gaming industry, visit ggbmagazine.com. Subscribe to GGB News to get all the news of the gaming industry delivered to your desktop every Monday morning. Sign up at ggbnews.com and use the coupon code GGB180 for a free subscription. Don't miss a single episode of the podcast. Subscribe on Amazon, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify today. So we'll see you next time on the GGB Podcast.